While these costumes have been celebrated as some of the best looks of all time, as you will learn, their iconic status is often brought about by the talents of some of Hollywood's most famous costume designers and the collaborative efforts of the creative team, both in front and behind the camera. When curating this list, I have tried to take into consideration multiple factors, like how recognizable the costume is in pop culture, including the star power of the actor at the time it was worn up until the present day, along with award recognition for the design and the demand at auction. But if I haven't included your favorite costume, it doesn't mean that it's any less marvelous than any of these featured here. Now without further ado, in order of release date and spanning over 70 years, here are 10 more epic women's movie costumes. Amy Jolie, Top Hat and Tails. In principle, this costume worn by legendary actress Marlena Dietrich in Morocco, her first American film, might not seem like a design marvel, but it is notable for two story elements which were controversial at the time of release in America and caused a stir with audiences. During a sultry cabaret number, Dietrich is wearing men's clothes, and after plucking a flower from the woman's hair seated in the audience, Dietrich kisses her on the lips. At the time, a review in the New York Times described the pairing of Dietrich and Austrian director Joseph von Sternberg as a vehicle for exotic eroticism. According to Smithsonian Magazine, von Sternberg discovered Dietrich in a Berlin cabaret and brought her to Hollywood having first worked with her in 1930's Blue Angel, the first feature-length German full talkie and von Sternberg's magnum opus. Von Sternberg is personally responsible for making Dietrich a major star. In Blue Angel, she wore a white silk topper in the movie with stockings and garters. For her now famous costume in Morocco, the story goes that Von Sternberg was inspired to put her in a man's tie and tails when he saw her wearing the same outfit at a party in Berlin. In a letter to her daughter Maria Riva, Dietrich wrote, the best part of Morocco is when I'm in my own tails. They look unbelievably beautiful. Von Sternberg used that look first. The audience, of course, is expecting the legs, so you see her in trousers first. Good idea? Joe's, of course. He knew how wonderful the top head and tails would look. According to Dietrich, the studio roof blew off when they first saw her featured in a short publicity trailer wearing her tails. But von Sternberg defended the decision, telling Paramount, I am responsible for directing Miss Dietrich, and she will wear what I choose. Trousers or slacks, as they were called in America, were not worn by women because, as Dietrich wrote, no man looks at a woman in trousers. The costumes of Morocco were brought to the silver screen by Hollywood costume designer Travis Banton. He is perhaps best known for his long collaboration with actress Marlena Dietrich and director Joseph von Sternberg. In 1927, he became designer-in-chief at Paramount. Lloyd Llewellyn Jones wrote in his excellent book, Designs on the Past, How Hollywood Created the Ancient World, that studios developed particular house styles over the decades, and each studio had a head designer who created the on-screen wardrobe of chiefly its female stars. At Paramount, it was Travis Banton who dressed Marlena Dietrich, Carol Lombard, Mae West, and Claudette Colbert. Dietrich loved working with costume designer Travis Banton because, as she said, he has the same respect for Joe von Sternberg that I have and is willing to do the sketches over and over until they are right. We have the same kind of endurance. We never tire. According to Nate D. Sanders auctions, off-screen, Dietrich perpetuated the androgynous image the scene created, often dressing in men's clothes. While not the tie and tails from Morocco, this navy blue tuxedo ensemble is from the estate of Marlena Dietrich. It dates to the 1970s to 80s, during which time she performed in tuxes in Las Vegas. Gilda, black dress. What's so special about a black strapless gown? 
Well, a lot as it turns out. Costume designer Jean-Louis said of the gown worn by actor Rita Hayworth as the ultimate femme fatale Gilda as she performs her sultry, slightly burlesque number, was the most famous dress I ever made. Glamour magazine wrote that, Audiences were in absolute awe because it seemed to defy gravity. No matter how much Rita moved in her dance, the dress did not. The gown was a marvel of engineering in addition to its beauty. As head designer for Columbia Pictures, Parisian Bourg Jean-Louis worked together with Hayworth on multiple pictures in which he became an essential ingredient in the formula that created the image of Rita Hayworth. Author Jill Field stated in her book, An Intimate Affair, Women, Lingerie, and Sexuality, that Louis drew upon Madame X, John Singer Sargent's oil on canvas portrait of Madame Pierre Gautreau as inspiration. Originally, Sargent painted one of the straps slipping off her shoulder, but when the portrait received more ridicule than praise, he repainted the shoulder strap and kept the work for over 30 years before finally selling it to the Met but said, I suppose it is the best thing I have done. Fields added in her book that Gilda's dress retains the shape of Gautreau's in Madame X, though Jean-Louis made it strapless in the contemporary 1940s mode, enhancing the sense, especially when Gilda dances, that as in the painting, the dress flees from the body. To be able to wear the dress, Hayworth had to wear a corset, because just a few months prior, she had given birth to her daughter, Rebecca, and had not yet regained her pre-pregnancy figure. Louise said, Rita had a good body. It wasn't difficult to dress her. She was very thin-limbed, the legs were thin, the arms long and thin, and she had beautiful hands. But the body was thick. She also had a belly then, but we could hide that. The Oscar-winning designer said, Everybody wonders how that dress can stay on her while she sings and dances. Well, inside there was a harness like you put on a horse. We put grow grain under the bust and darts and three stays, one in the center, two on the sides. Then we molded plastic, softened over a gas flame and shaped around the top of the dress. No matter how she moved, the dress did not fall down. The black satin gown with side slits is paired with a pair of full-length satin opera gloves in the identical fabric to the dress fabric. In an interview with Photoplay magazine in 1946, the film's director, Charles Vidor, said, I remember the day on Gilda when she first walked on set wearing that half-naked black satin number and dragging an ermine cape on the floor behind her, just as the script ordered. Rita had to study at night, so did Jean-Louis, the dress designer, but somehow he kept one leap ahead of us all. So that particular May morning, none of us knew how Rita was going to look. She sauntered on the stage, holding her head high in that magnificent way she does, stepping along like a sleek young tiger cub, and electricians began dropping light bulbs, carpenters began dropping hammers, and the whistles that sounded would have shamed a canary's convention. It was a good 10 minutes before I could restore anything like calm. But Rita smiled in her sweet and secret way. She enjoyed every second of it. Then she did that elaborate, difficult mame number in two takes. The scene with the black dress has been referenced in several films. Jessica Rabbit in the Disney film Who Framed Roger Rabbit performs Why Don't You Do Right, similarly to Rita Hayworth in Gilda. For the 23rd James Bond film 2012 Skyfall, costume designer Jenny Tamim referenced the dress while creating an outfit for Bond girl Severine. In April 2009, the dress was to be sold by the auction house Profiles in History on behalf of the Forrest J. Ackerman estate. The initial price was estimated between $30,000 to $50,000, but the lot was withdrawn before it reached the auction. Later in September 2009, the dress appeared mysteriously in an auction on eBay with a starting price of $30,000. Delilah, Peacock Dress Delilah wore this legendary costume before Samson's destruction of the temple in Dagon. 
Edith Head, likely Hollywood's most celebrated costume designer, created all of Hedy Lamarr's looks in Samson and Delilah, winning one of her eight Oscars for costume design color. The American Film Institute credits her with 496 films. Head has earned more Academy Award nominations and wins than any other woman in Oscar history. The relationship between the director and the costume designer was different during the golden age of Hollywood. Llewellyn Jones wrote in his book that it was customary in the studio's wardrobe departments to assign different tasks to a set of designers. The principal female wardrobe was always assigned to a studio's head costume designer. Producer and director Cecil B. DeMille appointed five designers to dress his cast in Samson and Delilah. He gave the glamour assignment to Edith Head. Hedy Lamarr wore a total of 10 costumes in this movie, but Head was often required by DeMille to submit up to 30 sketches of each costume for final approval. Llewellyn Jones wrote, Edith Head thought that DeMille's habit of overstaffing costume designers was a ploy for him to maintain complete control over the visualization of his films. If he had several designers attempting to costume the film, then he became the unifying factor. Head said, Samson and Delilah is not the picture of which I am proud. I never thought I did great work for DeMille. I always had to do what that conceited old goat wanted, whether it was correct or not. He never did an authentic picture in his entire career, and in my opinion, that made him a damn liar as well as an egoist. Because of the Motion Picture Production Code, a film censorship in America, Llewellyn Jones writes that actress Hedy Labar was not permitted to show her navel. Consequently, Edith Head was forced to come up with novel ways of concealing the actress's navel and restrict the appearance of protruding pelvic bones. A stickler for detail, Head referenced sources from Egyptian and Babylonian times to get the look just right, but noted that because of censorship, the correct costumes were not allowed when you present someone in a bodice, you immediately have a costume that's not historically right. Llewellyn Jones writes that DeMille demanded something extraordinary for Delilah's last appearance and said that he wanted a costume with peacock feathers. For what reason, I don't know, Head recalled. Head said in her book, Edith Head's Hollywood, I have always had the feeling that that was entirely wrong. I doubt very much that there were any peacocks around or nearby in the days of Samson and Delilah, nor would anyone, even Delilah, have worn the kind of cape that I designed, or any other costume for that matter. Delilah's peacock gown and cape included 2,000 gilded peacock feathers. It took 12 women three weeks to finish the costume. Debbie Reynolds' auction with Profiles in History describes the costume as a two-piece biblical concubine type revealing gown consisting of a halter and long skirt both elaborately adorned with peacock feather eye appliques. The original turquoise substrate on both pieces disintegrated some time ago so it was replaced with new fabric to preserve the essence of the original design. The costume from the Debbie Reynolds collection was auctioned off in June 2010 to Paramount Pictures, the original studio that produced the movie. Costume designer Deborah Nadulman later reunited the bodice and skirt with its cape for the Hollywood Costumes exhibit at the V&A in London. The cape was borrowed from the Cecil B. DeMille Foundation. Margot Channing Evening Gown Edith Head won her third Oscar for All About Eve, likely because of this iconic chocolate brown off-the-shoulder party dress worn by Betty Davis, when her character Margot Channing, after downing her martini, famously quipped, fasten your seatbelts, it's going to be a bumpy night. This dress is made all the more famous because of the lead up to the making of the picture. Firstly, Betty Davis was an 11th hour replacement for actor Claudette Colbert, who had ruptured a disc in her back and would not recover in time before production began. Secondly, Davis, who had already established a great relationship with Edith Head while making two other pictures with her over at Warner Brothers, asked if she would create her costumes for the film. 
The trouble was that the costume designer at 20th Century Fox, Charles Lemaire, remember that every studio had their own head designer, had already designed and created all of the costumes for the entire cast of All About Eve, including Margot Channing. But when Davis was hired as the replacement for Colbert, Charles Lemaire had already moved on to his next project, so he agreed to borrow Edith Head from Paramount to make a new set of costumes for Davis. As a last minute hire, Head had only 40 days to design, build, and fit all of Davis's costumes in time for shooting. Of this now famous costume, Head wrote in her book, Edith Head's Hollywood, my original sketch had a square neckline and a tight bodice. I had extremely high hopes for this dress because the fabric, a brown gros de Londres, which is a heavy silk, photographs magnificently in black and white, and it was trimmed in rich brown sable. To give you an idea what it looks like, here's an example of chocolate brown gros de Londres, which translates directly as Big London. The fabric is similar to the texture of gros grain ribbon. The gown also incorporated side pockets, a feature that Davis appreciated in a coat dress made for her by Edith Head in the movie June Bride. Head wrote, Betty liked the coat dress so much, she had six of them made for herself in varied colors. According to blogger Screen Chic, the pivotal party scene would be shot after the cast and crew returned two weeks of location shooting at San Francisco's Curran Theatre, providing Head with a bit of breathing room to craft one of the film's most integral costumes. But because of the accelerated workload, this particular design wasn't completed until the night before the party scene was due to be filmed. Head arrived early to make sure that the dress was pressed and camera ready, but when she arrived, she saw that Davis was already in costume and looking at herself in the mirror. And to Head's horror, the dress didn't fit at all. Head wrote in her book, the top of the three quarter length sleeves had fullness created by pleats, but someone had miscalculated and the entire bodice and neckline were too big. There was no time to save anything and a change would delay the shooting. One thing that the wardrobe department never wants to do is hold up the camera. It is a mantra on most sets. So, the thought of having to tell the director that they would have to delay shooting the party scene filled Edith Head with dread. But just before she was about to go talk to the director, Head recalled in her book that Davis had pushed the dress down off her shoulders and said to her, Don't you like it better like this anyway? To which, Head absolutely agreed and thought it looked wonderful. In turn, they secured the dress down with a few stitches and sent Davis to set, her quick thinking saving the production costly delays, but more important, Head's reputation. An exact replica of the gown, made for Betty Davis by Edith Head, sold in 2007 by Heritage Auction Galleries for 1900 US dollars. As you can see here, the sleeves and collar are not fully attached to the bodice. And while the original belt and brooch are missing, there is this lovely detail of these rhinestone buttons on the fur cuffs. Betty and June Haynes Red Gowns The two gowns worn by Rosemary Clooney and Vera Lynn in the final scene of White Christmas with their bold punch of red with the white fur contrast are a dramatic finale with the movie shot in Technicolor and the first to use Paramount's Vista Vision process, a higher resolution widescreen variant. The two women's gowns are made from silk charmeuse to contrast nicely against the men's slim velvet suits. I hadn't intended for Edith Head to dominate this list, and honestly, it is a coincidence that I am featuring three of her designs one after the other. While her designs for White Christmas were snubbed when they were handing out Oscar nominations, I think it actually deserved to be there. But don't feel too bad for her because by 1955, she had earned five Oscars and went on to make it an even six for Best Costume Design Black and White for Sabrina. Both gowns have a 1950s silhouette of a tapered waist and twirly whirly circle skirts over crinolines. Both Clooney and Lynn wear matching red gloves and white fur muffs. 
Both gowns are ornamented with sequins in the pattern of snowflakes for a hint of sparkle, with Clooney's V neckline, her hair, and muff embellished with a Christmas flourish of red holly berries with metallic leaves. Like all of her costumes in the movie, Lynn's gowns feature a mock turtleneck collar. Vera Lynn's longtime friend Bill Dennington said, All of her life she wore something around her neck, a necklace, a choker, a scarf, a collar, etc. It was her trademark like Van Johnson wore red socks. I saw her neck many times. It was lovely. Here is Edith Head's design of Rosemary Clooney's costume. It appeared that Head might have played with the idea of having a gown with a removable jacket, but as we saw in the film, the costume remains very close to this colored design. At the Rosemary Clooney house in Augusta, Kentucky, while they do have some of the original costumes like their sister's dresses, the white Christmas costumes featured here is in fact a reproduction. As one visitor pointed out, however, there are some clear differences. For instance, the collar is a wider pointed collar compared to the small shawl collar on the original, and the sleeves are set in. Sadly, the origins of the red gowns are unknown. Anna Leon Owens, Ball Gown. In The King and I, the Shall We Dance sequence is likely one of the most loved scenes in movie musical history. Who can forget this magnificent pink champagne silk gown, the way the rigid bodice snugly hugs actress Deba Carr's midriff, the poofy sleeve staying firmly in place on her upper arms, while the volumes of skirt fabric and petticoats overlaying her hoops float about her body as she is whisked about the soundstage by Yul Brynner. The costumes were designed by multiple Academy Award winner Irene Sheriff, likely best known for her creation of Elizabeth Taylor's outstanding wardrobe in Cleopatra. Sheriff won both a Tony in 1952 for the stage musical of The King and I and an Oscar in 1956 for Best Costume Design Color for the film of the same name. Sheriff said in a 1970 interview, If I have a leitmotif, a logo, I suspect it is associated with the colors I prefer, reds, pinks, oranges, and with a certain cut which seems to reappear in many of the shows and films I've worked on. Here is Irene Sheriff's design for the movie. Rather than using white paper, it was very common for costume designers and illustrators to use the ground color of the paper to represent the costume color and then go back in and add the highlights and lowlights with pencil. In this rendering, Sheriff gives great detail to the hairnet, which is very similar to the one that's worn in the stage musical. It's reported that each of Deborah Carr's gowns weighed between 30 and 40 pounds due to all of the volumes of skirt fabric, hoops, and petticoats. In the Shall We Dance sequence, Carr suffered continual bruising from the hoops in her skirt. And baking under the hot lights on set, she lost over 12 pounds and would often refer to herself as the Melty Miss Carr. Here are a few pictures of the stage version of the costume worn by Gertrude Lawrence. While it is very close to the film version, Sheriff did make some changes to the bodice and sleeves. I actually prefer the film version with the smaller Gigo sleeves rather than the larger, almost Lego mutton sleeves. Those sleeves had pretty much gone out of fashion by the 1860s. Downfilled sleeve pads or poofs, like we see here, were often used to give the fullness to the sleeves. According to Profiles in History Auctioneers in California, the sleeves were covered in lace with hundreds of clear sparkling decorations attached, which you can see sparkle in the light during the dance sequence. And while the gown is very low riding on her shoulders, Irene Sheriff added a sheer modesty piece to the low neckline using the same netting as the overlay on the sleeves. This piece of fabric sewn inside the neckline would often be called a tucker, there are many historical examples of this in the 19th century. Sadly, time has not been kind to this gown. The fabric has suffered from what looks like repeated cleanings and or light damage. 
Also, it's not uncommon for the bodice and skirt to mismatch like we see here, all the more obvious after several decades, especially if the bodice has been cut on the grain while the skirt has been cut on the cross grain. And you can see that the skirt has hooks and bars on the waistband, which would have been used to attach the skirt to the bodice when wearing the costume. It's always a little surprising and somewhat of a disappointment to see such a memorable costume pictured on a mannequin, creased and made all the more droopy without the underpinnings to give the gown its proper structure. The stamp of the original costume makers, Fiddler's Costume and Design, appears in both the bodice and skirt. The inner structure of the gown doesn't look as pretty as the outside with the use of zippers and exposed boning, kind of being a no-no for higher end construction. But despite the lack of preservation, this gown sold at auction in 2010 for $4,500. Dolly Levi Gold Dress. Not to be upstaged by Edith Head, Irene Sheriff designs for Hello Dolly earned her another Oscar nomination in 1969. For this movie, she teamed up with director Gene Kelly, who had previously starred in An American in Paris, another movie that Sheriff won an Oscar for in costume design. While not as critically acclaimed as The King and I, there are many beautiful costumes worn by Barbara Streisand throughout the movie, and I think that most would agree that her drop-dead gorgeous gold gown worn in the Harmonia Gardens number when she sings the title song Hello Dolly deserves a spot on this list. From the Barbara Streisand archives, it's said that Streisand requested a color of the gown to be changed from red to gold so as not to compete with the much circulated publicity photos of Carol Channing, Broadway's Hello Dolly, in a scarlet colored gown for the big number. The archives also state that Sheriff had recently designed gold costumes for Cleopatra and was very familiar with how it would photograph on camera. This is why she insisted Barbara's gown be made using real 14 karat gold. But it's also likely that the production design was taken into consideration because the gold really pops against a background of the red carpet and male dancers dressed in red tails. You might also notice that when Barbara makes her descent down the stairs, the gown has a train which later disappears. Sheriff had to shorten the train for the dance number because Barbara couldn't dance in it without tripping. In a Life magazine transcript, a formidable sheriff didn't give in so easily during rehearsals and would have preferred that the choreography had been altered rather than the gown in what must have been a timely and expensive endeavor. Auction House Profiles and History stated that the costume is purported to be the most expensive dress ever made for a film, costing over $100,000 to construct. That's like more than a half a million dollars in today's money. Sheriff said in an interview, the thread used in the Hello Dolly dress is made of pure gold. It comes in very fine tubes, is pliable, and can be threaded like beads. Because of some technical lighting problems, the gold material was the only way I could achieve the quality that both the director and I wanted. Almost one pound of 14 karat gold thread and embellishments were used in its creation along with hundreds of Swarovski crystals. Gemstones in various colors also accent the velvet base of this dress. The gold and beading was also used to create the choker and the matching shoes. The headpiece, meanwhile, was made from birds of paradise feathers, which are now illegal to use. This gown, headpiece, and shoes were obtained by Debbie Reynolds and displayed in her costume museum before being sold at auction in 2011 for $123,000. US Princess Leia White Gown her costume is beyond simple, but we were first introduced to the most famous space princess in movie history, Princess Leia Organa, wearing this modest hooded gown when her ship is captured by Darth Vader's ship at the beginning of Star Wars A New Hope. And while Debbie Reynolds had possession of some of the greatest costumes in movie history before selling them at auction, one that she didn't own was the one worn by her own daughter Carrie Fisher. 
The costumes for Star Wars and its sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, were designed by late British costume designer John Mallow, who earned an Oscar for Star Wars. Before Mallow was brought on board, there were multiple concept designs for Leia, done by Ralph McQuarrie, based upon the descriptions by director George Lucas, along with his story treatment, as a way to pitch the film to the studio. Here are some of the very early concept designs for Leia that have a Flash Gordon feel to them, one of the many inspirations for Star Wars. The sketch at the left is featured in the book, The Cinema of George Lucas. In these storyboards, Leia is wearing the demure hooded white dress envisioned by Lucas and McQuarrie. In an interview in the making of Star Wars, John Molo says that Gene Harlow was his inspiration for Leia's look. Here are some earlier concepts of Leia's white costume by Molo. Molo said that at Lucas's suggestion, his costumes were designed to be color-coded so that the good guys wore organic colors in earth tones while the bad guys wore more technological colors in black and gray. There are exceptions to the association of evil with technology, however. Molo notes that while Luke's Star Wars 1977 outfit is actually a light tan, Leia's dress is stark white, marking her as part of the technological world as well. At Lucas's request, Leia's white dress ultimately went in a much more European direction, mock medieval, as Malo noted. Like many of the costumes that were constructed and rented for Star Wars, Malo had the gown made at London costume shop Bermans and Nathans, later acquired by Angel's Costumers in 1992, and had an outside prop maker fabricate the belt with the silver buckles on it. My thoughts on the fabric of Leia's dress were that it was some form of jersey, but not silk because that would snag and pull too easily. It was actually a poster on a forum who tipped me off that the fabric might actually be Kiana, a silky nylon knit fiber developed in 1962 by DuPont. A popular fabric in the 70s, Kiana is described as a polyamide fabric having improved resilience and silk-like hand combined with superior washwear performance. Sadly, DuPont no longer produces the fabric. If you want to learn more about Leia's famous buns, click on this video that I have here in the corner. Satine, Black Diamonds. While this movie features many drool-worthy costumes, in fact, I will likely do a dedicated video to the costumes in the near future, I think Nicole Kidman's Satine Black Diamond costume while singing Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend is a standout costume and worthy of this list. Because from a storytelling perspective, it's the first time that we as an audience, and in turn Christian, see Satine arrive on a swinging trapeze. Like many of the costumes on this list, her designs for Moulin Rouge earn Australia's Catherine Martin, who is also married to the film's director Baz Luhrmann, a well-deserved Oscar in outstanding costume design. According to Australia's Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, the costumes were not designed to be reproductions of costumes from 1899, but to give enough flavor of contemporary Western trends to capture interest and entice us into the past at the Moulin Rouge. Satine's beaded and sequin high-cut corselet originally included a full-length skirt, but the beading proved too heavy, so the costume was reduced. Catherine Martin said that Nicole Kidman suffered a lot in her costumes. Kidman herself revealed on The Graham Norton Show that she broke a rib for the second time while getting laced into her corset, stating, I had this thing that I wanted to get my waist down to 18 inches, which Vivian Lee had on Gone with the Wind, and I was like, tighter, tighter. After breaking her ribs for the first time after falling down the stairs during the Pink Diamonds routine, she said, I then rebroke my rib getting into a corset. Kidman also said in the behind the scenes video that it was very uncomfortable doing high kicks in a corset. Forget it, she said. They all had bruises and their nerves went numb because of the faux whalebone sticking into them. The heavily boned corselet has a base of black cotton with an overlay of net covered with sequins, bugle beads, and paste diamonds of varying sizes in a mermaid scale pattern. Shoulder straps of black fabric are covered with paste diamonds. 
The corselet fastens at the back with two black cotton laces through 14 metal eyelets. According to IMDb, it took 20 minutes to lace Nicole Kidman into her corset. Her pair of full arm length gloves are made from soft black kid leather. Kidman's black suede heeled shoes are by Charles Jordan. Kidman's top hat is made by milliner Rosie Boylan out of black beaver skin and edged around the brim with ribbed black braid and then finally trimmed with a rhinestone band. Meanwhile, originally a crystal and wire top hat was created, which took a whole week to make, but was not used after screen tests. Beatrix the Broad Kiddo, Yellow Tracksuit. For a large chunk of the movie, the bride, played by Uma Thurman, exacts her revenge on her former deadly viper, Oren Ishii at the House of Blue Leaves but not before she goes on a killing spree of Yakuza soldiers in order to get to Oren. During the entire scene, the bride is wearing a two-piece bumblebee yellow tracksuit with contrasting black stripes down the jacket sleeves and pants. The scene took eight weeks to film, six weeks over schedule. For her work on Kill Bill Volume 1 and Kill Bill Volume 2, costume designer Catherine Thomas received two Costume Designer Guild Award nominations in contemporary costume design. The designer tells Golden Derby in a video interview that Uma's yellow tracksuit in Kill Bill is probably one of my favorites just because it's so, so much part of the film and the iconography and that, you know, and working with Uma back then, she was just like an amazing supporter of mine. I wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for her. So, you know, that has a very special place in my heart. Here is Thomas's design for the scene, although it shouldn't be confused with the two-piece leather motorcycle outfit worn in another scene of the movie and featured also on the poster. Like many contemporary designs, these kinds of costumes often get little respect or accolades. During the 18th Annual Costume Designer Guild Awards, director Quentin Tarantino told the audience in LA, None of my costume designers have ever been nominated for an Oscar because I don't do period movies that have ball scenes with hundreds of extras in them. For the last 20 years, I go to Halloween parties. I see a girl with blonde hair wearing a yellow tracksuit with black trim. To tell you the truth, I've always considered that maybe the greatest award. The bride's yellow two-piece tracksuit was inspired by the jumpsuit worn by martial arts star Bruce Lee in his final film, Game of Death, from 1978. While there's been some speculation as to why Lee would choose that particular color, some even suggesting that Lee wore yellow as a statement about his race and culture, the reasons were actually completely practical. Game of Death producer Andre Morgan said in a 2015 interview, when Bruce came onto set for Game of Death, the wardrobe department produced two tracksuits to choose from, one yellow and one that was black. Once we sat down and went through the script, we came to the scene where he fights Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who kicks him and leaves a dirty great big footprint on his chest. Of course, if the suit was black, you'd never see the footprint, so we went with the yellow one. It was a wardrobe decision, simple as that. While I cannot confirm this, my understanding is that the bride's yellow tracksuit was actually produced by Mudo, a Korean sporting goods brand. And then the bride wears a perfectly matched pair of ASICs on its Suka Tiger Tai Chi model with the word FU on the sole. Bruce Lee was the first known celebrity to popularize this design. Because of the long shooting schedule, multiple stunt doubles, Uma Thurman had at least two, along with the gradual wear and tear and additions of blood throughout the two month long shoot, there were likely dozens of tracksuits and shoes that were used. Perhaps Tarantino will take heart in knowing the costume designer and curator Deborah Nadulman included the bride yellow costume, one of just a handful of contemporary movie costumes in the Hollywood costume exhibit, which began at the Victorian Albert Museum in London and later traveled the world. If you love Hollywood costumes and you didn't have a chance to see it yet, make sure to check out my women's epic movie costumes. You can click on it right here. Thank you for spending time with me. I'll see you in the next video.